So without further ado, welcome everyone to the January NASA Night Sky Network webinar. Tonight's webinar is kicking off 2018, NASA's Year of Human Space Exploration. Each month there will be themed materials and resources, and tonight we have Patricia Moore here to tell us all about it. Hi, Patricia. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi how are you guys doing tonight? Hope everybody's doing well. I'm glad to be joining. Um, do we just, just go ahead and get started? Before we get started, I wanted to do a quick uh, activity, a new feature that we're going to have now on these monthly webinars is just highlighting one of the Night Sky Network activities related to each month's topic. So it'll take two minutes and sure. in honor of pushing the frontiers of space exploration, we're going to commemorate America's very first satellite, Explorer 1, which was launched into space 60 years ago today. So congratulations, America, we did it. <laughs> um, the Night Sky Network Planet Quest Toolkit features a very cool demo called Why Do We Put Telescopes in Space? And I thought that would be a good topic for this evening. Um, so while Explorer 1 might not be on the tip of your audience's tongue, a lot of people know about Hubble. And you might want to ask them why they think we spent all that time and energy and money putting a telescope up in space. Uh, a lot of times people will say, well, we have clouds here on Earth or rain. Uh, you can mention light pollution in cities. And of course, half the time we are in daytime and it's very hard to see the night sky uh, with the sun out. So while we're incredibly lucky here on Earth to have this atmosphere, it's not always great for observing. Let's take a look at the atmosphere we are talking about. There really isn't too, too much of it. If you have a ball about the size of a basketball, um, if you shrunk the Earth down to this size, most of the atmosphere would be just about a paper's width thick. So very, very thin atmosphere. But our um, space satellites have to go up about um, 300 miles or so, which is about the thickness of this bubble wrap that we're going to use to um, demonstrate the atmosphere. So if you're outside, you can do this. You point to a star on the horizon and see if they notice anything about it. And it's often twinkling that they'll notice. And that is due to our atmosphere. If you're inside, you can use something like this light right here. So we just have a little light in the toolkit where you can get one yourself. I'm going to turn off the green screen for a minute so that I can show you how this works. So um, I hand my visitors a telescope. This is just a paper towel tube with that same atmosphere on it and ask them to look at the light through the atmosphere telescope. For you joining us from home, I'm going to go ahead and um, you might want to move your telescope a little bit. There you go. Can you see that star is twinkling with the atmosphere from Earth? But if we go above the atmosphere, no more twinkle. That's really nice. We get a lot more information about that. So quick challenge for you all. Put your telescopes on. Don't worry, nobody can see you. No peeking through your other eye. That's if you actually have one of these telescopes. But you guys, I'm going to see if you can figure out which space object I am holding up. Put it in the Q&A, no, put it in the um, chat window there. Can you figure out? Oh, there's a lot of problems with this. There's some glare. Uh, what have you got? Yeah, we've got a nebula. Good guess. <laughs> yeah, excellent. So as opposed to seeing something from Earth that would be a little fuzzy, you can see this is the Lagoon Nebula. Um, and it's much easier to see these from outer space, which is part of why we put telescopes in space. It's uh, avoiding the atmosphere. The activity has a lot more background. And uh, you can find it. I'll put the link here in the chat window. And, if you're watching this after the fact, you can see the link in the below. All right, so yeah. I just found something literally this morning in the archive room. It was from this bound thing from 1980, and I just opened it because that's when I was born. And I'm like, ooh. And there's an old paper about the Hubble Space Telescope, mm -hmm. the design of the instruments, a very dry thing in the Astronomical Society of the Pacific Publications. So <laughs> I thought that was kind of neat. I was like, oh. Anyway, since we're talking about old spacecraft, it's a very old <laughs> Anyway, That's I'm great. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Um, and now for our featured program, I want to introduce Patricia Moore. She is a NASA museum liaison. She works at Jet Johnson Space Center in um, Houston, but she is actually working at, for headquarters. 
She has more than a decade of experience equipping museums and science centers with relevant and up-to-date resources. Um, Patricia shares NASA's efforts to enable human exploration into deep space. And we're so honored to have you here with us tonight, Patricia. Tonight, I think she's going to tell us about the NASA's current and future plans for human spaceflight and outreach resources. So please, everyone, welcome Patricia Moore. All right. Hi, everybody, and thanks for having me tonight. Um, I'm going to share my screen and pull up my slides. We can kind of walk get those together. All right. All right. Oh, that's like the last one. We don't want to start at the bottom. We want to start at the top. <laughs> All right, there we go. All right, so um, thanks again for having me tonight. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of go through um, the focuses of the Human Spaceflight and Exploration Operations um, Directorate, which is, a, 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 if you're familiar with how NASA is structured, that's just one of the, the big over umbrella entities of, of NASA. And so we're basically responsible for everything that has to do with getting humans into space. It's the human space flight and operations um, part of NASA. Um, and then after we talk about what we're doing right now, um, an effort to, to get humans farther into deep space and uh, onto the moon and, and eventually onto Mars, then we'll close talking about some of our outreach efforts for 2018 and, and um, our monthly topics that we hope that you guys can be a part of and utilizing the resources and the programming that you do in your communities and, um, and even giving us some feedback on types of resources you'd like to see in the future. We've just started 2018. Um, we haven't even released the March um, 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 activities and lessons and resources yet. We're hoping to do that next week if I can get some final things approved. Um, so uh, feedback is always great. So let's kick it off um, with what our goal. So you know, NASA has an overarching goal and a vision and, and so does human spaceflight. So we want to help expand human presence deeper into the solar system. And NASA wants to be uh, the leader in that effort. And we are, and we are. And, um, but we're not going to do it alone. And that's kind of what some of the main areas we want to talk about um, tonight. So this is one of these great internal charts that we use at NASA to talk about um, our steps and our, and our phase one, phase two, phase three. But it kind of helps break it up. And um, it may not be the best for kids but for people who are a little bit more interested in, in NASA and kind of understanding of the long-term goals, it, it kind of helps uh, break things up in, into our phases. So in phase zero, which is what we're in right now, is pretty much everything that's going on at the moment. Um, and it, the major focus is low Earth orbit. So in phase zero, we have um, the International Space Station. International Space Station has been in space for many, many years, and, we'll, and NASA has promised to continue working with our partners to at least 2025 um, and maybe even longer, but that's where we've made the commitment to thus far. And we've got multiple countries from all over the United, um, all over the world working with us. And the way we like to look at space station is it's a, a floating laboratory. It's a, it's a, a, a in, in space, it's a, a research lab that allows us to do science experiments and testing that we can't do here on the ground. And there are many types of science um, experiments and, and research that take place on the space station, um, but here's a few that focus on um, some of the challenges and areas that we want to learn more about that, so that we would be prepared for deep space missions with humans onto the moon and then to Mars. Um, one of the major challenges is the human body. We're very frail. Um, we can build great hardware that's sturdy and can last months and years in a vacuum of space, but we humans are frail and our bodies have a hard time adapting and living in, weightless, in a weightless environment. So there's a lot of studies that we do on our own astronauts to help us understand and, and eventually be able to mitigate a lot of those challenges. And I won't go into detail on each of those, but, it, um, but if, you want to do, if you want some more research or information on some of it, you can let me know after, after the chat. So I mentioned partnerships. So the International Space Station is, is, is the perfect, um, the perfect uh, way of looking at how NASA and the, and the world and countries can do partnerships together. Um, we've got 15 nations that partner just with the International Space Station, and over 90 nations have, have been involved in research on the International Space Station. And we want to continue that model as we leave um, the low Earth orbit and go on to the moon and on to Mars and bring our international partners with us. So right now, happening uh, one of the main exciting things happening in low Earth orbit is our commercial and industry partners. Uh, right now, we have uh, SpaceX, Orbital, ATK, and 
Sierra Nevada uh, are, bu are building and sending resupply vehicles to the International Space Station regularly um, to provide our crew and astronauts with, uh, with supplies. So no people yet, but that is going to change this year. And at the end of 2019, I'm sorry, end of 2018 and end of 19, we will start to see our first test launch and then our human um, crewed launches with the Boeing and the SpaceX crew vehicles. So this is really exciting because um, NASA is supporting and really leading the efforts to help our commercial entities be able to send humans and our astronauts, American astronauts, to the International Space Station. So we don't have to rely on our Russian partners to do that for us. And then also to help industry and our um, and economic development grow. So this is really exciting. And, and so you be on the lookout for end of 18, beginning of 19, to see Boeing and SpaceX launch their first test and then our and then crew to the International Space Station. So that's all that's happening now in phase one with, within the next like year and you know to date. And then um, going into phase one is kicked off by the first integrated launch of the Space Launch System rocket and the Orion spacecraft. So this mission is slated for the end of 2019 with six months of risk built into it, which means um, depending on what happens um, in life, in NASA life, it could slip into 2020, but we're holding our partners and industry to that um, and end of 19 date. Um, and it's really exciting because the Space Launch System rocket is the most powerful rocket that NASA has ever built. Most of the pieces are already built and um, are, are, are sitting and waiting to be assembled. Um, and they will start arriving at the Kennedy Space Center uh, by the end of this year. So the end of 18, the beginning of 19, we'll start shipping all of our pieces of the rocket and of the Orion spacecraft to Kennedy so we can start assembling it in that huge building, the vehicle um, assembly building at Kennedy Space Center. So um, when, oh, this is just a, speaking of testing. So we've, these are some of the images of the hardware already built. Kennedy Space Center has completely modernized its spaceport, built new um, launch pads and um, crawler vehicles and mobile launch platforms that will be able to hold this new rocket. Um, and, and they've already have pieces of Orion there. And so this is a great image to show that it, this isn't a, a, ro a paper rocket. We are building and almost finished with both of these vehicles. And uh, at the end of 2019, we hope to launch it and um, send it on its 25 or so day mission to the moon. So this first mission will not have crew on it. We will always want to test a rocket at least once before we put humans on it. Um, but we will send Orion to the moon. It will take us about three to four days to get there. It's going to spend a couple of weeks orbiting um, in cis lunar space going farther um, than the Apollo missions did. So we're really going to swing out there um, uh, uh, past the area that Apollo typically orbited and do some testing on radiation, navigation, communication, all the different aspects of a spacecraft, make sure it works well um, with mission control, and then we'll send it home. Um, and it'll land in the Pacific Ocean. A, very similar to what Exploration Flight Test 1, EFT-1 did in 2014, only then it just went around the Earth and came back. This is actually going to the moon. And then um, this will kick off phase one. And once we're successful in that mission, <clears throat> If approved by Congress and it is, if it becomes part of the budget, which we hope it does as, as soon, we will begin our first launch of the Deep Space Gateway and we'll be able to take our first module or our first piece of that gateway to lunar orbit. So if you're not familiar with the Deep Space um, Gateway concept, this is our kind of an outpost um, around the moon. So before the new um, administration said that we want astronauts or NASA again to land on the moon, to put boots on the ground, we were always planning to have a presence in what we call cis lunar space in, in the vicinity around the moon so we could do a lot of testing and, and um, research before we send humans to Mars. And part of that was building almost like a mini space station, which would be the Deep Space Gateway. And it, as you can see, it's only comprised of maybe three modules. It's not very big. And that first piece would be the power system that would be launched on the SLS and it, it and an Orion would go to the moon and it would be a permanent structure. And then we would launch perhaps a habitat module and then an airlock. And, and this gateway would be a place where um, industry partners, international partners could send a spacecraft to dock and do research um, in deep space or in the vicinity of the moon. What's really cool is it can actually lower 
itself closer to the surface of the moon and then it can raise itself up. So it's not just staying in, a, in the same orbit like the International Space Station does around Earth. This allows us to go lower to the surface of the moon so we could deploy robotic missions or maybe even human missions. They're trying to make it a versatile uh, vehicle and also be a place to connect to before you go to Mars. You know, this you fly in an Orion, connect to the Deep Space Gateway, then connect into your transit vehicle to go to Mars and then on to your journey. So um, it kind of like an, an outpost idea. So that's the end of phase one. And all this, we believe we can get done, you know, in the next, um, you know, five to seven years if, if NASA receives the appropriate funding to get to get it going. Then we move on to phase two, um, which kind of expands the deep space gateway, having crews live um, in deep space around the moon for at least a year. That would be our checkout mission. Um, so our leadership at NASA says if we can have a crew live autonomously in um, in the gateway in a habitat or maybe it changes and we do a surface operation then we know that we are capable of, of sending our, our our teams to mars and so that would be our final checkout mission uh, but also part of phase two is the deep space transport concept and this is the vehicle that would take humans to mars so orion is not made to live in more than a few weeks at a time so about 14 days for a crew of four. So this is a great deep space vehicle that can be launched on a rocket, sent to the moon, to the deep space gateway, and then it could stay attached to the deep, force tra deep space transport and go on to Mars, but it also could stay there at the gateway until the crew comes back and returns and then use the Orion to, to splash down on Earth. So we haven't worked out all those details yet. We, um, there hasn't been an, a contract awarded to a, an industry partner to um, to build the deep space transport um, yet. Um, and so there's a couple of different designs. I've seen pictures and images of what Boeing's would look like and what Lockheed's would look like. So there are companies that are already thinking about what that vehicle would look like that would take humans onto Mars. Um, and there's some pretty cool concepts out there. And then of course a habitat would be also part of phase two is having a place for astronauts to live in orbit around the moon for a um, lengthy period of time. Um, like, kind of like we do on the station, we have six month rotations. Well, this could potentially be you know, one year rotations. And those habitat designs and concepts are already um, kind of in, in, in the uh, beginning phases with different industry partners. I know that Boeing has one and Lockheed Martin and Bigelow has an expandable module that's on the International Space Station now. They're looking at how that how that would work, you know, an orbit around the moon. So there's lots of companies that are already working with NASA to put together concepts, and they hope to have, you know, full-scale prototypes um, within the next year or so, and then NASA would choose a design um, and, and fund it um, to, to be a part of this deep space exploration system. So all of these, the vehicles like Orion, the SLS, the, the Habitat, the gateway, the, the transit vehicle that takes us to Mars, these are all part of our deep space exploration system. All right, and so there used to be a phase three area, but recently the, 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 the verbiage and the text was taken off the charts because we're kind of reworking it and waiting to see what um, the president's budget proposes our efforts. And, and, and if before it didn't have anything specific on lunar operations and putting humans on the surface of the moon. Since that's happening now, uh, they're kind of waiting to see and we'll get more direction and, and more specifics on, on that once um, a, a budget is released and then approved by Congress. So, um, when, and all, with all that, you know, you get a lot of outreach and, and kids and families, you know, they want to talk about Mars. You know, there's a lot of amazing things that are going to happen close to Earth around the moon in the next 10 to 15 years. But, you know, going to Mars is the ultimate goal. And a lot of times I get asked the question, well, why haven't we been to Mars yet? Why don't we send people there now? And, and then we remind them, as I'm sure you do too, that there are a lot of challenges and a lot of technology that just hasn't been developed and invented yet. And that's one of the reasons we want to inspire young people to go into STEM careers because NASA is going to need help. There are hundreds, I would say thousands of NASA employees who are at retirement age now that are from the shuttle the shuttle generation and they're you know in their early 60s or late 50s and they're looking to retire in the next five to ten years and and they are they say all the time when I talk with them it's like we need new young people with fresh ideas coming in behind us because we're retiring and you know we're getting tapped out <laughs> 
And so, uh, and so these are the types of challenges for Mars exploration. We need the in-space propulsion. You know, is there a better efficient propulsion methods that we can use to, to maybe cut our travel time to Mars in half? And we're exploring some of those now. Um, entry, descent, and landing. We haven't figured out how to land um, huge cargo um, payloads on the surface of Mars. We need the capability 10 times greater than Curiosity. That's how much supplies and habs and rovers and everything we need. And we don't have that capability yet. You know, so I won't read them all to you. You guys can read. But these are just some of the challenges and areas that you can talk um, with your, your groups about on how we need help and we need new ideas and these are the things NASA is working on right now. And on our, oh, let me skip ahead, let me go back. So our, our first mission to Mars, and NASA really wants to have it in the 2030s. And, and if we fix the timeline and, and, and money is appropriated the, the right way, we can, we can make that goal. And just like during the Apollo missions, uh, we may find our first mission to Mars, either a flyby mission to Mars, where we don't land, we just fly and orbit around the planet and then come home, or maybe we do some exploration of Phobos and Deimos. Um, and uh, this is a really beautiful image. You may have seen it before, but this graphic illustration is what, what I can say physically correct in that that's how big Mars looks like from the, the Martian moons. It's, it, they're very close to Mars. Um, compared to our moon, and um, and landing on them is much much easier, much easier than um, landing a huge um, habitat and all the systems and everything we need for for a mission to Mars. So I'll close with this slide, and then I'll pause to give it a chance to take some Q and A before I go into our outreach resources. Um, but if you get questions like you know why do we need to send humans to space what's the value i mean these are these are nasa talking points and you can do with them at what you want but you know knowledge is important you know human exploration helps us inspire to seek knowledge and to learn more and we always need to learn more as a species and as as humans and it makes it, it makes us have a better world and economic growth is really important um STEM careers are typically a high skilled workforce and 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 we need high skilled workers to take on the scientific jobs, the engineering jobs, and to help us establish partnerships and help us, you know, go out into space. So economic growth is huge. And then overall, you know, space exploration provides a better future. You know, um, it, it advances American leadership. We want to be the leaders in space flight and NASA is and will be for a very long time. Um, and, and with these partnerships that we can have in science and exploration with countries that maybe Typically, we don't have such great political partnerships with them, but we can have really great scientific and exploration partnerships with them. So, um, so there are lots of great things besides even all the spinoffs, which there's tons of books on. You can read off spinoffs that come from space, um, the space program. But you know, it's important. Um, and so, I hope I talked really fast to get through things. But if you have any questions about the, the, the human space flight story and what we're doing right now, I'm happy to pause and take some questions and then I can get into the resources in a bit. Looks like we have a couple questions in the Q&A queued up. If you wanna, can you see those Patricia? Would you like me to? Let me, yeah. Oh, let me get out of my presentation. Hold on, let me stop sharing and then maybe I can see. Nope, here it is. All right. There it goes. Oh, I see it. Um, let's see. Oh, pillars of creation, we're good. Yeah, I'm looking at that. Commercialization of manned space flight. What's the current status of Orion? So Orion is is a deep space vehicle. It is different than the commercial, very different than the commercial vehicles that are being built um, by Boeing and SpaceX. Their vehicles are made to go to the International Space Station only. Um, they are not robust and that they could not go to the moon. Um, and they may be able to go to the moon, but they probably, they wouldn't be able to come home safely. The, the entry, re-entry of a spacecraft coming from the moon in deep space is it's incredibly difficult. And the, the heat and the types of heat shield and re-entry capabilities is incredibly different than what would, it would only be to come home from 250 miles, which is where the space station is. So Orion is completely funded and is, is going forward. We've tested it once. It'll fly on a, um, the space launch system in about two years, and it will be NASA's vehicle to take humans away from Earth orbit. So Orion will never fly to the space station. It was never designed to go to, to, to take astronauts to and from the station. We are going to be relying on our commercial partners to, to operate um, and take humans and cargo to and from the space station from this point on. 
Um, artificial gravity. So I love when people ask me this question because right now we don't have artificial gravity, but there are so many people that are looking into it, even outside of NASA. I would just talk to someone a few weeks ago that, um, that, that used to work um, at the beginnings of the development of the International Space Station, even when NASA was partnering with Russia with the Mir Space Station. And he was asked to do research and designs and, and come up with, you know, could we make artificial gravity? And, uh, and it's possible, it's just really hard to control the, the rotation and the spinning. So I know this is something that they're looking at and for really long duration missions to Mars, we, we need something that has artificial gravity because being in space for that long is really hard on the body. So NASA doesn't have something that works, but I know that there's research and development taking place within NASA and even outside of, of, of ways to make, make it happen. Um, let's see. The, will the Deep Space Gateway orbit the moon or Earth with the moon? So the Deep Space Gateway is only going to orbit the moon. We are going to take the, the three proposed pieces, modules, to the moon, and it will stay in orbit around the moon. Um, we have a great space station around Earth. It's an amazing laboratory. And in this Deep Space Gateway, is it made to be another international space station? It's made just to be a gateway or a quick outpost that you stop to before you go on to, to, to Mars or before you go down to do a lunar operation. With the long duration missions to Mars, how would the radiation shielding be developed? Great question. And so right now, there isn't a magic material that protects our astronauts from radiation. Um, they'll get the highest dose when they pass through the Van Allen belt. And we did do that um, during EFT-1. They were able to get some decent, um, decent readings on radiation. Um, right now, and it sounds kind of funny, but right now what astronauts will do if we are expecting a large solar flare is they, they inside the Orion, and there's even a video I could share that you guys can see, um, is uh, they get down at the bottom of the spacecraft and they put a bunch of bags and materials and supplies and all sorts of things on top of them to shield them from radiation if they were going to have a solar flare. So when I share that with you, that it's obvious that NASA doesn't have a solution to really long-term radiation exposure. Um, the, uh, the special um, magic or whatever you call it, hole of the spacecraft or material hasn't been invented. The right now, the best thing we can do is layer um, with different materials. Um, Will autonomous missions advance to stage in the next 10 to 15 years that humans can avoid radiation hazards from deep space? If one year duration to moon turns out too dangerous, will this prompt development of highly advanced robotics? Hmm, I, don't, I don't know. I will have to see. I, I know that NASA and the world wants to have humans on the surface of the moon again and wants to send humans to Mars. And so I think that, that the hope is as the technology advances that we be able, we'll be able to have that that solution to radiation because right now we don't we don't and that's one of the reasons we haven't gone to Mars yet. Have there any have there been any significant setbacks in long-term health presented in space from the Mark Kelly year in space? So I wouldn't say any major setbacks. Um, they haven't released everything from the study. They've just released uh, bits and pieces. Um, some of the big things that that I hear medical doctors and what we call flight surgeons at NASA talk about is the, um, the issues with the eye. Uh, when you're in space, you have a fluid shift. And when you have that fluid shift, there's a lot of pressure that's put on the, your, the optical nerve and, and, and in your brain even. And that causes pain, it causes headaches, and it also causes, some, in some cases, extreme change in vision. And they have different, um, different machines up that are doing testing on the eyes of the astronauts right now on the space station. They even have an ultrasound machine and, and that, those sorts of things. They're trying to figure out how to fix that, and they haven't yet. So that's just one example. I know that he was very weak um, when he came home, being in space, even when you're exercising two to three hours a day. It's just not the same. And so there's a lot of physiological things, and I think having some sort of artificial gravity would fix a lot of those issues, but, but, but not all of them. Um, you touched on loss of um, corporate memory as senior scientists retire. Is the problem competition for talent by private companies or degradation of science teaching in the U.S.? Oh, well, um, I don't, I don't know which, which it could be, could be a little better. All um, I do know that NASA works very closely with private companies, and so you have NASA civil servants 
um, which are the managing and stewards of the government's money and stewards of NASA's money and our leadership. But then the majority of people that work in the space industry are actually um, a corporate or what we call industry partners. So your Lockheed, Boeing, Orbital ATK, Rocket Jet Aerodyne, you know, Jacobs Engineering, and you can go on and on. And so NASA work, already works very closely with these entities. And I know that they recruit and NASA recruits. And the hope is that pe the kids just go into STEM fields. We do want to make, we do want to inspire students to take STEM, um, to, to go into STEM careers, you know, so I think it's a, I wouldn't say there's a lack. I don't think the issue is a competition with NASA, um, but maybe we could do a better job of getting kids excited and providing opportunities for them to know that a STEM career is possible for them. This is my personal opinion, though. Um, the Space Gateway sounds fascinating. How will, will they set security issues for this if humans can only be aboard for 14 days? So 14 days in an Orion. So let me be a little bit clear. So Orion um, astronauts can comfortably live inside of Orion for about two, maybe three weeks, stretching it at the very most. Um, but the Deep Space Gateway will be larger than just an Orion spacecraft and would have a habitat module attached to it. So it would give it the, the much more space, not as much space as the International Space Station has. It has the volume of about a three bedroom home, which is really roomy, um, but, um, but they would give them enough room, the same amount of room that they would imagine astronauts would have if they were transiting and journeying on to Mars. So that's what that checkout mission would be. Let's put a habitat around the moon. That's gonna be about the same amount of space that a crew of, you know, however many people we send to Mars, maybe let's say four, would live in for, um, you know, eight months or so, and let's see how things go. So um, that that's more what I meant. Sorry to confuse you. And then looks like the last one for now would be how will the new spacecraft be powered? Will they be, will they use green propellant? So right now, um, there the 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 technology we use in space to power for our spacecraft is the same type of that we've used all along. Um, but with um, the research that was done um, in the last eight years or so for the asteroid redirect mission, which was canceled, um, but the technology and the information that we learned about the solar electric propulsion that we were considering using on that mission, all of that research is not in vain and we're considering using solar electric propulsion in our transit vehicle that would go on to Mars. That's just one, one idea. So, um, so yes, we, if we can get it working and get it efficient and get it safe and reliable, then the hope is that we would be able to use um, solar energy to help us get to Mars. But we're, we're not quite there yet. How much time do astronauts need daily in an artificial gravity environment to offset fluid shifts, vision changes, and so forth? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, so I'm not even going to try. <laughs> I, I probably have to ask somebody a little bit smarter than me. Um, to give you a good answer. Um, let's see, would consumables be need to be ferried? Yes, so if you're going to the Deep Space Gateway, the, the, the hope would be eventually, just like the International Space Station, our industry partners would be able to have spacecraft that could take astronauts to the space, a Deep Space Gateway eventually one day, or even cargo. Um, cargo would be a lot easier because there's really no reason for the cargo to come back. You know, you're just taking supplies up and then you don't need the spacecraft anymore. Um, our industry partners would have to, uh, like Boeing and SpaceX, would have to create a whole new type of vehicle to be comparable to NASA's Orion spacecraft because of the reentry capability. Um, you're coming in at 25,000 miles per hour instead of about 1,700 miles per hour. Um, the, the surface that your spacecraft experiences is about the temperature of the surface of the sun. <laughs> so it's, it's pretty intense. So um, yeah, they would definitely need to have unconsumable scent to, to the gateway. And um, maybe before yeah. we take any more, let's hear what you have and we can take some more questions at the end if we have time. Yeah, yeah. That's no good. Right, I'm just excited about your resources too. I haven't seen them yet. Okay, good. All right, so let's share my screen again. Get this going. All right. So. Um, all of HEO, which is this Human Spaceflight Exploration Operations Group within NASA, is kind of coming together to do a celebration of different areas of human spaceflight that are ex what we feel and hopefully you feel too are ex well, exciting to your audiences and to the public and to highlight the different work that we're doing now and what this will be happening in the future. So we've broken up the year by monthly topics and each month 
um, is going to include um, a suite of resources. You'll, you'll, we'll start off with key messages and a story focus, so you'll have talking points and a 10 to 15 minute presentation with script that you can start with and modify and add to or take away as you see fit. We'll include uh, lots of videos that fit within that theme. Um, any social media shareables that we develop with our graphics team here at NASA, we'll make those available to you. Um, print products, um, as you know, NASA doesn't have the funding to, to mail out goodies to people anymore. It's been like that for a really, really long time. So what we do for museums and informal uh, groups is we provide the PDF files or the layered uh, designer files that you can take to a print shop and get things printed. Um, and any education and outreach and activity lessons that are created by our education office that fit within those themes uh, will have a handful of different activities that fit a, a variety of age levels. Um, I mentioned raw files for designers, especially in museums where you have your own graphics um, team or, or, or department. Those raw files are really helpful when you're building exhibits or creating um, graphics or doing something special for your center. And then it sometimes we'll have uh, opportunities for virtual outreach events. Our team like to do Facebook live events. Sometimes we do Skype events or sometimes they're um, on like a NASA YouTube or a not yet NASA Ustream channel and opportunities that are virtual to, to you know, hopefully in March we hope to have our flight, um, our mission manager um, talk from mission control about exploration mission one and what it will be like to kind of operate um, the mission from mission control. And, and so we're looking at things throughout the month and unique um, events that people can be a part of. So we'll go through each of the the quarters, um, and then um, and then I'll kind of highlight what we've done so far for January and February, and what you can expect for later on in the year. So January, we're kicking it off with the space station because everything starts with the space station, learning and doing research on the station to prepare us for um, deep space. And then February is the year of education on the International Space Station. If you didn't know, we are going to have two educators on the International Space Station this year. So our educator astronauts, Joe Acaba and Ricky Arnold will both be um, in missions over the course of this 2018 timeframe. Um, and so that there's a whole suite of resources and activities that fit within the year of education on station. Um, March is focused on the heroes of space exploration, and not just our astronauts, but kind of people behind the scenes and the unsung heroes and the groups and individuals that help support our human spaceflight missions. And then April, May, and June, we're highlighting our deep space exploration system, focusing on the Orion in April, the Space Launch System rocket in May, and then June, our exploration ground system. So the Kennedy Space Center team is responsible for launching the vehicle, for assembling the vehicle, launching the vehicle, and then splashdown and retrieval and recovery operations. So highlighting all the really cool work and career opportunities um, and unique things in that group as well. July, we're going to have some um, resources that focus on the 60 years of NASA, celebrating that. Um, August, talking about partnerships. Together we go farther. Partnerships with industry, partnerships with academia, partnerships galore. So how, how do we utilize partnerships at NASA to help us achieve our goals? September would be focusing on the Mars generation, all the young people now who will help get us to Mars. And the opportunities and, and, and STEM careers and, 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 and ways to get kids excited about um, coming and working at NASA or for an industry partner one day. And then October, November, and December kind of wraps up the end, the end in our future missions. So looking to go, our mission prep, Humans to Mars, will probably be more focused on the moon than initially when we rolled out these topics. We're waiting to hear back from the White House and Congress to see what our, our, our directive is. And so October may be a, a much more moon focused in doing those missions to the moon before Mars. And then in November is traveling to the red planet. Everybody wants to know what those astronauts are going to do for eight months because they're in their spacecraft on the way to Mars. And so talking with the NASA experts and kind of what they have in store and plan um, for those eight months. And then December, closing it off with Mars orbit um, mission and then a surface operation. So that's your habitats, your spacesuits, your vehicle that would land on Mars, in situ resource utilization, living off the land, um, ge the geology that, that, um, that you're, that's going to be needed to be able to find the rocks and to learn about the surface. And so, so that's kind of what we're looking um, for overall throughout the year. And uh, the plan is to, to have those resources available one month, if we're good, maybe two months before the month kicks off. 
So that's what we've been able to do so far with January and February. Those resources are already available. And like I mentioned, the March Heroes in Space Exploration will be available by the end of next week. And you can find these resources not on the regular NASA website. You actually have to go to the NASA Museum Alliance page. And the link at the bottom is um, where you go. And this page is open to everybody. So even if you're not a Museum Alliance member, you should be if you're not, because it's free and it's a great resource. Um, but even if you're not, this uh, website is open to everyone. And when you click on that particular month, like January Living in Space, um, it takes you to a Dropbox page. And so I um, put together files and resources and packages unique to the needs of museums and science centers. They don't want YouTube videos, just like you probably don't. They want the original HD files. They want layered graphic files. They want um, the unique type of resources that I wouldn't put on a NASA website for the average Joe to have access to. So, um, so we provide links instead. So we go through key messages, presentations, and you click on whatever you want, and it'll take you to either a Dropbox folder where you can download it, or it'll take you to the NASA webpage if it makes sense to send you to a NASA webpage. And that's what we've done for the year of education on station as well. And as new resources are developed, and these groups and programs share with me new things, I will add them to the list. So I know there are going to be a host of what we call um, STEM, what do they call them? STEM, ooh, I forget the name of it. This group is, they had, um, there's a really cool, the, a trendy name they're calling it, STEM, ed, STEM stations or STEM, STEM experiences on the International Space Station. I can't remember what it's called, but they're gonna make new videos and new demonstrations almost every month. And so we'll upload the information here. So you don't have to scour the NASA websites looking for resources. I'll put what I feel is the best and the newest available to you here. And uh, so with that, the question to you guys is, what types of resources are most valuable to you? Um, I typically am told that presentations are incredibly helpful with scripts and videos and activities, you know, but if you have a unique um, need, it's always helpful to know what types of resources are beneficial and we can add that to our, our um, list of products. So I'll turn it over again. <laughs> But no. any other, I'll go, so oh, go great. ahead, sorry. Oh, I just have a question for you. The URL, it wasn't really showing up on the screen. You had informal.jpl.nasa.gov. And yeah, let me go back. And then I at the very bottom. Content. Yeah, so that we, last part. Just posted yeah, it's, it. It's, oh, bless your heart. Oh, you did? <laughs> you. Okay, good. <laughs> good. 2018, great. Thank you so much. I was just trying to yeah. find Yeah. Yeah, no Excellent. problem. All right, let's see. Okay. It is also on our there. resource page. Yeah, so it will be Perfect. on the main resource download page um, where you'll find this webinar by the end of the week and um, lots of other content and links. So that's great. I'm ready yeah. to go to the space station, just in case you're still taking astronauts. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> I want to go too. <laughs> I always tell, when people ask me, do you want to go to space? And I said, I will go to the International Space Station. I might even go to the moon, but I am not brave enough to go to Mars. <laughs> Take no. a special kind of person to go that far. That's just a little too far for me. <laughs> yeah. I'm with you. That's great. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm going to go a note Q from and a Stephanie yeah. in the oh, chat okay. that says presentations that we can use for astronomy club meetings are great. Yeah, that's really super yeah. helpful. Yeah, and um, some of them are easier to make than others. Like the Heroes in Space Exploration is the one I'm working on right now. And March also happens to be Women's History Month, and so I'm trying to do two. One on generic behind the scenes folks that help NASA and uh, um, unique careers that you don't hear about and, and maybe people who have saved the day that stories that you may not have heard about on the news and then the other one I'm going to work on is just women history um, and space exploration um, and so uh, those kinds of things if they're new and they haven't been created it takes a long time to get approved because every any presentation I make has to be approved through headquarters and you know things kind of move slow in the government sometimes um, but like April May and June there's tons of materials out there already, you know, and then celebrating 60 years of NASA. So some, like I said, some months will come out maybe two months in advance and others will be a little bit slower. It just really depends on, on um, what's all going on internally and how many new products have to be created and then how many things are already in existence. That's great. 
Um, it looks like we've got some more questions in the Q&A, and if anyone has more questions okay. about the resources too, let us know there. Yeah. So or I'm ideas for which might, might be useful to you and your settings. All right. So it's going to ask about radiation testing or solar for solar radiation flares or the concentrated on the Van Allen belt. Oh, so right now it was both. They did some radiation testing when Orion flew through the Van Allen belts and were able to get great readings on how how what kind of exposure they would experience and how and um, and if, if enough if a lot of protection is required. But um, their biggest concern would be like long term radiation exposure traveling through space. Um, because, you know, the astronauts on the moon got decent set of, you know, radiation exposure, and they were only there for a few days. We're talking about having an outpost there for a year. Um, and then, you know, Mars missions, the, Mars doesn't protect you from radiation either. So, um, so they're looking at testing and, and new materials for, for really focusing on the deep space radiation exposure. Um, what is your opinion on a one-way trip to Mars that is proposed? So my opinion is actually aligns in with NASA's opinion is that we want to send astronauts into space to the moon to Mars and bring them home. That's how we do business. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm on board with that. Um, there are some brave souls that might be happy to get shipped off to Mars and left there. Um, I, I would not be one of those people. And I think that would be really rough for, um, for Americans now, especially with social media and, and as much as we can see and learn, I think that the way to go is to plan a mission to get people there and to bring them home. And then once we establish a, a, a Martian, you know, habitat and a colony, then yeah, if people want to stay and live there and stay there, that's one thing. But to start things off, NASA is very big about building infrastructure and building the capabilities to get people uh, into space. And then once that capability is developed, then then you know, we can expand and do more. Um, so what's the best way for college students to obtain an internship at NASA and do you need interns to work with you? So there are several ways to become an intern at NASA. Um, there are two programs. There's the internship program that is run out of the Office of Education, or now they're called the Office of STEM Engagement is what the new name for the Education Office at NASA. And they have internships available all at all centers, and there's an online, I'll find the link. I'll just, I might have to just Google it. I'll do it in a minute when I finish with this because I don't want to accidentally hang up. Um, you fill out what your, your, kind of like your resume and what you're interested in, and they match you with a mentor and a program that's looking for someone with your skills. And, um, and so that's one way. If, if you want the path to a NASA government civil servant um, path, which would be like a government employee, they have a program called Pathways. And Pathways is, 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 is like I said, a pathway to a government employee to be um, a NASA employee and not an industry partner um, employee. Um, and then those are a little bit harder to get. Um, but, um, but sometimes um, students will do a couple of internships through the Office of Education and then go on to have a Pathways internship through NASA. And then there's, um, of course, internships with like the SpaceX and Boeing and Lockheed and Orbital ATK. So um, you have your traditional ones with NASA, industry partners, and then with NASA Education. And do I need an intern? Yes, I need an intern, but no, I, <laughs> I, but I, don't, I don't have an intern. Um, there are lots of different kinds of interns, not just engineers and science and STEM fields. We have business interns, legal interns, communication interns, educators that come in for internships to um, marketing internships. Um, so there are lots of different career paths. And I always tell kids um, that no matter what you choose to do in college, you could probably find a, 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 that, that type of career or your expertise at a NASA center because it takes all kinds to run the agency. Um, our club has also asked, been asked questions on African-American astronauts, astronomers, and resources, so this would be nice. Yes. So one of the, the, um, the things we're going to do for humans and, um, and exploration is, of course, have um, a diverse group of individuals highlighted through our women and then also through our, um, through our just general heroes in space. Um, are there any Voyager-like missions to the outer solar system outside the solar system currently planned? So I am not as, as knowledgeable about robotic exploration as I am on human space flight. I can tell you that there is a Europa mission planned to send a robotic mission, not 
like going as far as Voyager. To my knowledge, there's not like a really, really deep into the solar system mission planned at the moment. But um, we're planning to launch a Europa robotic mission on the Space Launch System rocket. So that big rocket that's going to carry Orion is also going to have the capability of carrying larger of satellites and larger space probes than ever before. It has the payload of, of about 12, the volume of about 12 elephants. And the um, evolvable, but even larger rocket that will eventually be created could carry the payload of like 22 elephants. So, um, so, and that mission will probably happen as of right now in the timeline between Exploration Mission 1 and Exploration Mission 2. Or it could be swapped in Exploration Mission 2 with humans could happen with SLS and then the Europa mission would be afterwards. They're still working out that timeline. I think that's all the questions. That is fantastic. Oh, Patricia, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. This is amazing. Really, really. You're welcome. All of this information. I'm excited for this next generation to be able to become a part of it. That's very cool. Thanks, everybody, for all of your outreach. I know that you do with the general public and with schools, and you've really done such an amazing job. Thanks for telling us about them. Um, I think that's it for tonight. Just a big thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And if anybody wants to stay in tune with what's going on with me, if you're not already hooked into the Museum Alliance, that's one way to do it. But about every month or so, I send out a net blast or an email when something new and cool pops, pops in. And so just shoot me an email and say, hey, sign me up. And then I promise I won't spam you. It's usually, like I said, maybe once a month. And only if it's something worth sending. I won't just send you random things. <laughs> um, and then you can stay in tuned and have access. But if you don't want to go that way, as long as you're a NASA Museum Alliance member, any large announcements that we have or resources we share get pushed through through their weekly newsletter. Great. Yeah, it's a great newsletter. Um, so thank you all. That's all for this evening. You can find this webinar along with many others on the Night Sky Network website in the Outreach Resources section. Uh, each webinar page also features all these additional resources and activities, and we'll post tonight's presentation on the YouTube channel in the next few days. Um, 